Welcome to Sunday Science Q&A. How's the weather where you are? Anyway, I just had, uh, before we started doing this, I was just outside in the garden. It was sunny and it was also snowing. And uh, this is the first time that's happened. And then I did ask Helen because I was interested. I thought, is it possible for there to be a snow bow? But we believe that the crystalline structure is too complex to create the snow bow. So we'll deal with that later on. If you So if you had a question about snow bows, that's dealt with. We don't need any more of that. Uh, we're going to talk about dinosaurs today, which is always one of our most popular subjects. We have an enormous number of questions in already. Uh, but please do feel free, as this is a live show, to send in your questions. You can either tweet them at Cosmic Shambles uh, or you can pop them in the live chat and Trent will make sure that I see them. And uh, today we rejoined. We have uh, Susie Maybent with us again and uh, Susie, who was also on the uh, the final episode of the most recent series of Infinite Monkey Cage, which uh, people became very obsessed with uh, the nature of uh, tasting rocks. And uh, we'll probably be talking about that more. In fact, we definitely do have some questions on that as well. Uh, we're joined by Riley Black, who is uh, an amateur paleontologist but a professional science writer and the writer of uh, a new book Secret Life of Bones and obviously we have Helen Chersky as well just to mention a couple of things which are uh, if you can support us via our Patreon uh, we always make sure these are free and Book Shambles is always free as well uh, but there are other shows that we make which are kind of made Patreon only We've, we had to start doing that because of the fact that all of uh, my usual work and all of Trent's usual work is, it remains destroyed for the time being with some glimmer of possible hope in the summer and uh, uh, our latest Patreon stuff includes uh, just at midnight uh, last night where we put out a documentary about The Exorcist 3, which is a phenomenal film. We have uh, Mark Kermode on that and Mark Gatiss and Sam Deegan and uh, Reese Shearsmith and Kim Newman. Uh, also, our series Tips for Existence, uh, where I talk to scientists and artists about the things that kind of drive their life and give them comfort, etc. Uh, that is available for Patreon. We just finished series one of that. Series two starts next week because normally when a series finishes, is we immediately start another series and series two starts with neil gaiman uh talking about the importance of stories uh for uh our survival and our sense of self and our sense of purpose and joy and all of those other things as well um what else do i need to mention uh i think i've nearly done everything now oh no no, no. oh yeah next week there isn't uh uh because so, uh, uh helen is so busy now she's actually found that she can do work beyond zoom meeting style live chats that uh, uh are the proliferation of the internet at the moment uh uh, and so, but we are going to put up a, a, a conversation uh, that Helen had. We're going to debut that at three o'clock next Sunday, and I'll tell you more about that later on. But let's get started. So, um, Helen, what happened this year, this week in science? Science. Um, well, what happened? So uh, today, we, it, sort of, it fits in with today's uh, topic, and it kind of links into, into last week's as well. So last week, we mentioned Ernest Rutherford in passing in connection with uh, when he was head of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge when the, when the atom was split. But a bit back before that, uh, we're going back to 1911, and that was the first, the, a guy called Arthur Holmes had the first go at estimating the age of the Earth. So this is 1911. So we're past the point where most, as most scientists understood it was old. It was very old fossils could not be explained by any 6,000 year old earth but the question of exactly how old it was was not clear and Rutherford had suggested when Rutherford discovered that um, uranium could emit helium and turn into lead and people started to understand this radioactive decay what did it mean they realized it worked at a fixed rate and then they worked out that you could then, if there had been only uranium and later you had some lead, you could use the ratio between the two to start thinking of it. So people have suggested you might use that to estimate ages. And in 1911, Arthur Holmes was the first guy to have a go. So he went to known layers in the rock. So these layers that the geologists name, the Devonian, the Silurian, uh, you know, they knew that some were older than the others because they were sitting underneath the others. And he did radioactive dating for the first time in order to create a series and came up with an age of the earth which wasn't right he came up with 1.6 billion years which which isn't you know it's, it's a bit short but by the standards of the time that was an immensely long period so it, it's the first and you know there were people kind of nosing around with these things thinking of these things but it that was the time so this paper in, in april 1911 when there was really first a number to get your teeth into if you wanted to understand what the earth was like what it what it is this planet how long it's been hanging around that 
was the first actual number to get your teeth stuck into your um, very sharp teeth if you're a, a t-rex for example and also it, it i'm sure this will come up later on but this idea of the, the the period of the earth's history that the dinosaurs existed for was extremely long compared with the time between the dinosaurs and us for example i mean you know the, i think that the last the two dinosaur experts will tell us this but the latest dinosaurs to go extinct are closer to us in age than the first dinosaurs in the fossil record and so all these so suddenly there were numbers and you could get some context for the age of the earth so that was uh, 1911 so 110 years ago this month Brilliant. for at the end of this month aren't we yes yes and i do have my diary my diary this, end of this, end of this month. month i'm so used to it isn't it i think it's the end of april <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it remains yeah, in right. the future for now, but in the block universe, it's either there or uh, April 27th, we're going to be doing that. But uh, go to Cosmic Shambles and we'll tell you more about that. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, Riley, now your book, The Skeleton Keys, uh, The Secret Life of Bones, a great pun, by the way, Skeleton Keys. I'm impressed by that alone. Can you tell us before I ask you a show and tell just a little bit about that book? Yeah, it's about our skeleton evolutionary natural history a natural history in terms of what people have done to skeletons thought about skeletons really where our bones came from what we think about them how they've informed our views of the afterlife all these things twine together because i've found that people often think of bones as dead static stuff that they're unchanging or they think of fossils and it's just this dead thing in the rocks and not the stories that bones tell that each and every bone is basically a time capsule of our lives of prehistory that connects all vertebrate life together so that's really the story that i tell in skeleton keys now, it sounds very interesting about the ideas of the afterlife and stuff like that. One of my favourite uh, poor quality is a skeleton walks into a bar and says, I'll have a pint of beer and a mop, please. Um, the, uh, um, but that, that's it doesn't get any funnier, Robin. I, I love it. I love those jokes. I love those jokes. Are you, but the trouble is, because as we know with you, you don't have a visual imagination. You didn't see the beer going down or the mess that it made. No, I just thought the problem was obvious. Why would you drink the beer? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the issue with the lot. No to be honest, you know, horses don't talk. Uh, there's, there's a, most jokes have a, a lot of the problems that people go to the doctor with in those jokes are entirely fabricated for the purpose of the scenario. We will do scientists and jokes a special very, very soon where we'll test a physicist. Well, in fact, we'll do two. We'll do uh, we'll a theoretical. The uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll find out which one. But yeah, that, that's a fascinating thing. Can you just tell us a little bit about that idea of how skeletons inform our sense of of the afterlife well one of the you know ways that we think about death and i'm a terry project fan myself so death as a skeleton in a robe with the scythe and that sort of imagery coming after the black death and this like this is what awaits everybody on the other side that we don't think about our skeletons most of the time unless you go to the doctor and you have an x-ray done or something like that but that this is sort of this visage of death and it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing it often is but it could also be this positive aspect as well this sort of aspect of vitality that lives beyond and can tell your story when you see a skeleton especially a human skeleton in a place like a museum it's not something that's like oh this grim reminder i mean it can be if you're of that mindset but it's something that like that's somebody's life there that's something that grew and changed and responded and i really love that aspect of science that's not just like okay well we can't really learn anything beyond the outside it's all the stuff that's contained within sort of informs our our view of what life was and how we're connected to that's brilliant. One should always have a memento mori wherever possible. This one is spring loaded as well. Um, I'm the, still uh, using mine. <laughs> yeah. The uh, um, can you and have you got a show and tell for us as well? I do. Yes. Yeah. Speaking of bones and skulls. Now this is not a real bone. Uh, this is not a real skull because fossils like this should belong in museums. But a few years ago, when I was writing another book called My Beloved Brontosaurus, I went to an estate sale for Utah's first paleontologist, uh, state paleontologist, Jim Madsen Jr., who ran the University of Utah paleo program long ago. And he often made casts of the fossils that he studied. So since I was writing a book about big Jurassic sauropod dinosaurs, <laughs> I bought a skull that he had made. So this is a replica of uh, a patasaurus. And what I love about this is this animal would have been about 30 tons and about 80 feet long in life so it would not fit in my house at all and yet i can hold the skull in my hands you know that you can see the brain case back there <laughs> a really small amount of space can we identify what all it. the holes are so there's some eye holes and there's some ear mm -hmm. holes are there and then what Absolutely. Are the other 
There's quite a lot of holes. <laughs> There's quite a lot of holes. And that's one of the reasons that you can tell this is a dinosaur is the number and placement of the different holes on the skull. So this is the orbit. This is where the eye would have sat. This is the nasal opening on the top of the skull. But the nose wasn't here. We now know that the nose, there would have been soft tissues that extended down the snout. So the nasal opening would have been near the end. These holes at the back, this identifies Apatosaurus is a diapsid, this group of reptiles that most lizards and crocodiles and things like that today also belong to, basically means two openings. So these are jaw closure attachments where muscles would have threaded through. So you have two on the top and you also have some holes on the side as well. And the rest of them, I mean, this is pretty, it's pretty airy for the kind of skull that it is, that you have this sort of opening in front of the eye as well that's very characteristic of dinosaurs. So, like you said, it's kind of shot through with different sorts of holes. But once you know where the eye is, you can sort of visualize where everything else might go. That's great fun. I, thought, I, I think yeah, I, that's the biggest show and tell we've had so far, isn't it? We've never had some lift one, because I thought that was sort of part of your furniture or something. You know, I wasn't, hadn't really looked at it, but it was just in the back. I thought it was, you know, could have been your cat for all I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do have my German Shepherd with me. Let's see if I can top the camera a little bit. Morning, Jack. Hey, oh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Oh, the dog's not really interested in all of this. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he's heard it before. He's heard it a hundred yeah. times. <laughs> it's one of my favourite things is that it, there has not been enough dog barking, it turns out, previously in television and radio. And of course, now that we do more like this, you have these wonderful moments where, uh, you know, the dogs, start, <laughs> the astronauts' dogs are barking in their living rooms as you try and interview them. Um, thank you. That's a, a wonderful show and tell. Susie, Susie now, now uh, uh, it's great because this reminds me actually of that conversation we had on Infinite Monkey Cage, where when we talk about geology and when we start to look out of the window and we realize that much of what we see now, which may be field and meadow and and you know hills and you start to discover things about you know ideas of when this was was the bed of you know seabed and and this and that to me is one of the beautiful things about a lot of the work that that you're involved in as well in creating those pictures of the world the the world that you are standing on or sitting on now what it was uh you know five million years ago one billion years ago and all of that and that that to me is this palimpsest that starts to get created yeah absolutely and you know i I, that's what I love about it. And, and I actually, I don't understand how people can go for walks in the countryside and not look around them and think, how, how, is, how is there a hill here? Why is there a hill here? Why is there a big valley here? You know, how did these processes form? How did, how did these, these, you know, these features form? And I think, I think that's a really, really fascinating thing to understand and, and to wonder about. And I, I don't understand how people walk around and not think all of that stuff. Um, and, you know, since I have been studying geology and, and, and dinosaurs, uh, people, I think my, my family at least, um, do do that a little bit more. So I get regular text messages from my mum's walks with photos saying, why are there these things here? Um, so, you know, I, I hope that maybe some of our work will inspire other people to think like that as well. Well, there's that beautiful thing, you know, which is I, I was brought up in the Chilterns and, you know, chalk is a beautiful thing, whatever. Mm. But I never really had that awareness that all of this chalk that I could see and all of those badger sets where it had been burrowed out and all of that chalk was life. That was sea life. And, and once you are given that piece of information, the fact that I was able to grow up without knowing that. As you were saying, the visions of what you see just change and it's just everything becomes so much more vivid and tangible. The past becomes something that, that you, you start well, you can hold. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, the chalk is mind blowing. And, and explaining that to kids, I was I, I was fossil hunting um, on, a, on a beach down in Seven Sisters National Park um, where, the, where the, the, the chalk comes out um, to the coast there um, the huge chalk cliffs. And, and there was my friend's kids and, and my kid on the beach and they were looking around going we're fossil hunting we're fossil hunting and I was just like well look all of that cliff that you can see the whole you know right the way to the horizon all of that is fossils 100% fossils and it's just it's totally mind-blowing it's incredible now what is your show and tell okay well um, my show and tell does relate a little bit to um, our uh, monkey cage discussion um, for those who might not have been there um, we did have a um, a discussion about why I eat rock. So today I brought along a bag of mudstone, um, or as I'd like to call it, lunch. Um, so this is <laughs> this is a bag of mudstone. Um, it's a it's a reddish mudstone. It's actually claystone, and I know that because I bit a bit and ground it against the top of my mouth, and it was nice and smooth, and there was no sand grains in it, which indicated that it was very very fine grained. So it was clay, and this is actually from a, a site in the Isle of Wight um, where. 
um, a whole range of um, a whole group of very very small kind of two-legged dinosaurs called Hypsilophodon were found, and these are some of the um, the best known small dinosaurs, small two-legged dinosaurs, herbivorous dinosaurs that are known from the UK. And there is, uh, or, or the story goes, that pretty much every Hypsilophodon individual that we know, which is something like thirty or forty specimens, was found from this single layer of mud right here, and that they were. Um, the idea is that, that, that maybe these were a herd and that they had been overcome in a flood or they had got mired. Um, and this is why all of these animals died in this one place. And we don't have any evidence of them anywhere else um, across the UK or in southern England. Um, and so we, we've been doing a little bit of research on this idea um, to see whether that actually stands up to scrutiny. We've been looking at the rocks. Um, and the reason that I guess I wanted to bring the rocks, apart from the fact that, you know, I've been stuck in my office, in my in my spare room working for the, the last year and don't have any fossils at home, is that, you know, that, Actually, what's really, really important is the rock. In understanding dinosaurs, it's the context. It tells us so much. It can tell us sometimes more than the skeletons themselves about the way that the animals were living, the way that they died, um, and you know all sorts of aspects of their paleobiology. Um, so it's one of the reasons that um, sometimes I think that I prefer rock to um, to, to, to actual fossils, and not just because it's tasty. Oh, God, for a moment, <laughs> I think we should say uh, one of the reasons I prefer rocks to human beings. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought that would make you very popular on the on the yeah. beach where someone you know there's a load of fossil collectors and, and the fossil falls out and they're all fighting over it and you're just like oh i'll have the rock that's fine yeah <laughs> yeah it's the first new at christmas they didn't play with the toy they played they with played the box the it came in. yeah um <laughs> this is well, i'm going to throw you a question first of all actually uh then susie which is this is from dave dave wants to know what is the lineage between the tyrannosaurus rex and the chicken what is the lineage <laughs> Okay, well, um, the um, so T. Rex is a, a meat-eating dinosaur, a theropod dinosaur, um, and um, chickens are birds, and birds are the direct descendants of the theropod meat-eating dinosaurs. So, in biological terms, in biological lingo, um, birds are dinosaurs. They are part of the broader group that we call dinosaurs, and so T. Rex and a chicken would have uh, shared a common ancestor. Um, Riley, do you know how long ago that might have been? I'm going to guess that was, oh, go on, you know, you can tell well, me. But yeah, birds spun off about 150 years ago. I mean, Archaeopteryx is the first one we recognize right. as a bird. So that belongs to that Solorosaur group that Tyrannosaurs came from, and they showed up shortly thereafter. So yeah, it would have been about 150 million years ago that yeah. those two lines split from each other. Yeah, so some, somewhere about then, maybe a bit before that then we have a common ancestor that evolved in one branch to t-rex and in one branch to chickens you know i've always thought about um so there's i'm sure it'll come up jurassic park's been in the in the news recently but i've always thought i i love the idea of new zealand before the humans turned up being the actual mm -hmm. closest thing to jurassic park you know birds no mammals lots of quite big I, I would love to have seen a giant mower like if you if i was going to pick an animal from history that I really wanted to see that wasn't an actual, you know, sort of oh. giant mower, <laughs> just because they're yeah. terrifying. But that, I mean, is there, are you, are you going to pop my bubble on that? Is is that far from reality? The idea that this bird filled quite recent history was, is it, is it, would it give us any hints of what, what a Jurassic Park might be like? Far more fun anyway. I mean, I think well, it depends on what species you selected for it because we have dinosaurs as this monolithic group right and that you know they're all kind of the same we compress them in time and we compress them in space but they were as diverse as mammals are now so if you you know did this in a different way and had sort of a mammal park um you know it it would have all different sorts of in it, or at least it would have a selection, one would think, of, of different groups of animals that all behaved in different ways, ate in different ways, might have had different physiological profiles. I mean, dinosaurs were that diverse, and it wasn't sort of just like the plastic supermarket toy kit <laughs> version. Now we've got what I love is what I love is as we know imagination is very very important to science and some of the questions we get have a beautiful amount of imagination. Chris's question is, and I'll throw this to you, uh, Riley: uh, mm -hmm. Were the really tall dinosaurs at higher risk of lightning strikes? <laughs> there is a great piece of, art, uh, of this by a paleontologist named Bob Nichols who illustrated this. I think I have the print somewhere around here, but uh, it's feasible. We don't know this from direct evidence. 
but just based upon, I guess, the physics of how lightning works, like, sure, it, it, it's a perfectly great thing to imagine. I wish that we had something more tangible. And I don't think there's any way that we can ethically test that in any way whatsoever. I guess unless you made a whole bunch of dinosaur casts and put them out in a field in the middle of Wyoming in August or something like that and record the lightning strikes, I think that's the closest we could probably get. But I really like that idea, at least. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take Steve Merchant out for a walk during an electrical storm, and that'll give us some sense of that. <laughs> Sorry, Susie. You... I was just going to say it would be an amazing fossil to find, wouldn't it? A, a, yes. A or a, a Camarasaurus with a, I don't know, evidence of a lightning bolt, a lightning yeah. strike well, on its, well, on its well, skull or something. Which How I guess would, would be feasible, right? Because we have fulgurite. Fulgurite is a mineral yeah. created by lightning strikes. So if you had a sauropod skeleton with a big old through it and full great beneath like you have a pretty you have a nature paper there right. <laughs> right we've got a question we've got a question from uh teddy who's six years old hello teddy uh and uh teddy would like to know why is dinosaur poo so useful <laughs> so do you want to start on on uh on on, on that one uh, uh susie yeah I, i'll take that one uh, I don't know that dinosaur poo is any more useful than any other parts of, of the dinosaur or indeed the rock that's around it. But what, what dinosaur poo can do is it can provide us with context about how the animal was living its life. So, for example, we might be able to find in a fossilised chunk of poo, which is called coprolite, um, what whether the animal was eating a particular type of plant, whether it was eating ferns or, or maybe uh, ginkgos or something like that, or other plants that were around at the time, we might be able to find um, some fish scales in its stomach. So there's a, there's a dinosaur from um, the UK, a spinosaur called Baryonyx, and it's, it's known from Surrey, from the Lower Cretaceous, and it was actually found with fish scales in its stomach. Um, and that uh, suggests that, you know, this was obviously at least had it did some fishing um, and it probably ate fish. So if we found some fish scales in its poo, then that, that might be able to tell us about that too. So it, they can it can tell us about the diet um, of the animals. And of course, it also tells us that the animals were there in the environment. So sometimes we don't have the bones preserved. The bones might, you know, the carcass might have been torn apart. It might have been scavenged by other animals. It might have been washed away in a flash flood, but we might have other remains of the animal left. Sometimes that could be footprints, um, but it could be poo as well. So it just adds all of this context to help us understand how the animals were living their lives. Is Thank there any way to link up with, with a species? I mean, apart from size. I know this sounds like a stupid question, but if you, you found two coprolites, two piles of fossilised poo, can you say anything about where what they came from? No, and I think that's probably the big problem, and that's also a problem with footprints as well, is that unless we have the animal literally in the process of doing the poo when it died um, and that sometimes happens with fish fossils actually um but it you know it, you're not going to be able to say this was definitely this species but you can maybe narrow it down like you said based on size or um, based on it you know is it just herbivore poo and what herbivores do we know in the environment that you know do we already have evidence for so you can kind of narrow it down but that that is a that is a big problem and it, as i say it's the same with footprints and we might be able to get a broad idea of what the kind of dinosaurs that made the footprints but actually which species it was is really really hard unless the dinosaur literally like eh, is at the <laughs> yeah. end of the trackway and, and we, I, we don't have any of those isn't there a case in pompeii where there's someone there must be i mean there's everything in pompeii right there's a human <laughs> in the found on the toilets when the uh after, you know, the sort of, i don't know it happens for humans maybe it happens for dinosaurs too once or yeah, twice I, I, it's just that it's so much for you know so much longer ago the chances mm -hmm. of preserving something like that um are just so <laughs> so so much more uh, unlikely and i mean for sure it, it must have happened you know something yeah. must have left a footprint and then died at some point mm -hmm. uh, but it's just there, you know, yeah well, the ch chance of us finding that is really really hard yeah there's one paper about a protoceratops and a possible uh, back footprint that went along with it. But then again, the footprint looks a little bit questionable. And that's one of the hard parts about trace fossils like this is, you know, a fossil poo, you know that what it is and you can take thin sections, you can test it and do geochemical analysis. But footprints sometimes like, is that a footprint? Is it an under track? Is it just something fell there and it kind of looks like a footprint or not? So even the one case we have, we need a little bit more information to tell. Uh, we've got a question from got a question from eight year old Marnie. Hello, Marnie. Marnie would like to know: Is there a general term for flying dinosaurs, or is the general term flying dinosaurs? <laughs> Riley. Yeah, uh, there isn't beyond flying dinosaurs because they belong to different lineages. So many birds today are flying dinosaurs, although not all birds fly, as we were talking about before. 
other dinosaurs that were uh, there's a paleontologist named uh, Mike Habib who works in um, University of Southern California. He says that all basically rap- feathered raptors that were relatively small were aerodynamically competent in some way. And I love that phrase because it opens up this possibility of all these different ways of flapping, fluttering, gliding, trying to do something in the air. And we know that multiple lineages of non-avian dinosaurs, in addition to the birds, did this. We're getting really weird ones now that have almost these bat-like wings where there's skin that's attached from the wrist to the rest of the body in addition to feathers. So beyond, you know, we can trace the origin of birds pretty well at, at this point. But in addition to that, there was this, you know, evolution doesn't experiment because there's not a logic behind it, but just through what happened through natural selection, there are all these different sorts of feathery dinosaurs that were doing something in the air. And the only thing that really links them all together is flying or aerodynamic dinosaurs. And that's really me. Yeah. <laughs> prize to the first person who writes a dinosaur book, which has a chapter about the aerodynamically incompetent dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> I want them. <laughs> I think that would have to be an ankylosaur, probably. Like, if I was aerodynamic as a brick. As a brick. You see, that's a great, I mean, that's the beautiful thing. I remember, I think, in, in Life on Earth, where David Attenborough showed the tree kangaroo, which is not a particularly, it's not even very good at climbing. It hasn't had to evolve that many skills because it lacks predators. And therefore, it just needs to be a little bit better than the other clumsy tree kangaroos. And, that, and that's a beautiful thing of watching, you know, mutation, heredity, and natural selection in action. Oh, that sounds like my life as a writer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have a uh, now this one could open up in quite a few areas, I think, because Narell would like to know. So we hear a lot about the meteor strike uh, killing off the dinosaurs. Uh, but how much did it affect plant life on the Earth at the time? So, Susie, if I could start with you. Mm, there's been some recent work on this um, and I probably am not as up to date with it as I should be. I'm going to admit to that right now. Um, but I think um, that the. there is an increasing body of evidence from a couple of different places to suggest that there was um, some faunal turnover at the boundary and that that we actually have a a, sorry floral turnover at the boundary we actually do see um, that there are plants that you know the the, the plants after the extinction are actually somewhat different than the ones beforehand Um, it's always really difficult to um, uh, to tell these sorts of things actually and and the degree to which different extinctions have impacted different um, groups is is really highly controversial. And even the largest mass extinction of, of all time, the end Permian mass extinction, which occurred 251 million years ago, um, that people still debate the impact that that has on plants. Um, and people originally thought that it, it, it basically wiped out the coal forests that um, that formed, you know, the, 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 these huge forests that then deposited the coal um, all around the world um, and it wiped them out but now people are beginning to kind of row back on that and say actually is this just a sampling bias in the fossil record so a big problem is that uh, our fossil record is is not a faithful chronicle of life through through time mm. it's biased by all sorts of factors um, not just our ability as paleontologists to um, go out and find fossils um, but also you know maybe what we're most interested in um, but also just actually the vagaries of, of, of geological preservation so sometimes something will preserve a fossil some some particular geochemical environment will lead to a fossil being preserved and 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 other geochemical environments won't and of course the thing with plants is that they're they're primarily soft um so you can get wood preserved um and you can get wood solic- um, solidified in the fossil records um but wood you got you, so you, you you might have a bit of a trunk or a bit of a branch, but how do you know that the leaf that you may be found over there goes with that trunk or that branch, or the spore that you found in your in your you know your your claystone sample? How does do you know what what plant part that goes with and what you know? And, and and so it's really it's actually way more complicated to work on plants. Paleobotanists are crazy, um, and I think that this this causes um, a lot of these kind of unknowns uh, and a lot of these degrees of uncertainty but I think that there is a a kind of increasing body of evidence to suggest that there was um, at least uh, some turnover in some places in the plant communities after the dinosaurs went extinct. Wonderful thank you wonderful thank you this is uh here's a a nice nice idiosyncratic one again for you riley this is from uh the twitter account thrown with great force uh (laughs) and uh uh, just like so could dinosaurs blow bubbles? (laughs) I mean I've I would imagine theoretically, yes. Um, I'm trying to think about the way that dinosaurs breathe because many non-avian dinosaurs 
probably use this uh, system we see in birds today and in crocodilians today where they can do unidirectional breathing and that it's not this deep in and out like we do that the air moves in and then the, with the next breath more air comes in and it pushes the old air out you know alligators and crocodiles have a more bellow like system they breathe a little bit more like we do but still possible this highly efficient sort of very reptilian way of of breathing so there wouldn't have been that kind of like you take a big breath in and then you can you know stick your head underwater and blow a whole bunch of bubbles um yeah that, that that's something I, I think i'd have to like talk to some respiratory folks and there's Sorry, swim blood so swim some fish um fish that have swim bladders when they rise rapidly mm -hmm. current fish in the water column mm -hmm. can blow bubbles out of their gills if they're but i don't know about the presence of swim bladders in um old in you know fish like things that were around in the do you know do you know anything about swim bladders because i think that's probably the most mm -hmm. likely bubble blowing category <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like that phrasing. I mean, I imagine bony fish, teleost fish, in the fossil record will be able to to do that. Uh, dinosaurs, you know, since they have lungs, we know that lungs evolved before the first tetrapods came onto land. That's why, like, lungfish today have lungs and are able to to breathe air in addition to breathing underwater. Um, so, yeah, I, I think fish, you know, bony fish, uh, through their millions of years of prehistory, would have you know been able to do something similar. But uh, I like that question because it brings up like these alternate modes of making noises and, and, and doing things in prehistoric environment uh, that non-avian dinosaurs might have done. Uh, there's a paleontologist by the name of Phil Center at a paper a few years ago, what did dinosaurs sound like? And we often don't have that direct information about like vocalizations per se, except for very few. But the idea that if we look at modern reptiles that they might have rubbed their scales against rocks or against their own bodies, they might have slapped their tail in, in the water, clapped their jaws or things like that. So I imagine blowing bubbles, if they could have done that, might have been another form of dinosaur communication or, or the way of having fun that didn't involve vocalizing with the throat per se thank you thank you very much for your question yeah. thrown with great force so that we could probably keep exploring that for the next half hour uh, you're watching sunday science q a just to mention that next week is one of the rare weeks where we're not going to do one but instead uh, we're putting up a conversation at three o'clock uh with helen and Ginny smith uh talking about how brains deal uh human brains deal with time uh and that goes off in many different areas so that's going to be three o'clock next weekend and also just to mention that um if you are able to support us via patreon patreon.com slash cosmic shambles uh it makes a huge difference at the moment because this is the main kind of way that we're creating things because we're not able to go out on the road and tour and do all those things so if you can if you can't we're always going to be making this for free uh so that everyone can can watch it and the same with book shambles as well uh but if you can uh there's lots of other things that we're creating as well especially for you um now uh this is from uh, scruffy 45 whose son uh is five years old and i will ask all of you this i'll start with you riley uh the question is what is the most colorful dinosaur and what colors was it because this is so interesting Ooh, because okay, yeah. it's such a recent area i mean again this is what's always beautiful about whenever we do dinosaurs is it's one of the ones where it's most easy to to observe the speed of the change of understanding that we have which of course is across science but here it's such a kind of visual world so sorry yes sorry. absolutely yeah i mean if you'd asked this question i mean we've had this question for as long as we've understood non-avian dinosaurs if you ask this maybe 15 years ago it's like well we don't really know like maybe one was flamingo pink if it ate little you know lake invertebrates or something like that but now we can start to get an idea at least some of the colors that non-avian dinosaurs were and a few years ago there was one named uh from i think jurassic of china named kai hong that has basically had iridescent like almost rainbow plumage you know, much like if you look at a crow or a raven or something today and it catches the light just right and has a kind of oil slick kind of look to it and there are these little organelles called melanosomes that carry pigment that are in the feathers that it's structural color so as light hits it it basically refracts back in a certain part of the spectrum it's not chemically created color it's not like a carotenoid or something like that but through the structural color we can get idea at least that some of these dinosaurs you know just if they turn just right in the light you know struck that model pose back in the jurassic they would really lit up in these sort of very bright colors and that's just one out of that's just one that we know of because we have the feathers like most dinosaurs we have no idea what the color is quite yet susie yeah, um, I mean, Riley's absolutely, absolutely right. You know, people used to ask me this question, as you say, 10 or 15 years ago, and I would have said, you know, we'll never know. We're never going to know what, what colour dinosaurs are. And, of course, 
now we do or at least now we do you we know we know some of them and uh i guess kind of the sad thing for me is that the, the dinosaurs that i work on the the ornithischian dinosaurs the bird hip dinosaurs now these are things like stegosaurus and triceratops and iguanodon um all the best dinosaurs um they <laughs> don't have feathers um, and actually you know well at least i should probably say that that the vast majority don't have feathers and there's very scant evidence that that maybe a few of them had some sort of kind of filamenty type structure but but hardly any feathers um and that means that we, we can only find these little tiny cells that hold color pigment in feathers so in scaly skin you can find those 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 uh, little cells and people have looked at it but there's not such a good uh, correlation between the shape of the the cell and the color so what we see in feathers is that if, if the cell is like, I think I've probably got this the wrong way around, but it doesn't matter. It, it, for example, if the, if the cell is kind of long and sausage shaped, then that gives a brownie color. Whereas if it's really round, it gives a black or gray color or something like that. When you look at that in scaly skinned animals that are alive today, that doesn't seem to hold quite so well. So there's a, a little bit more questions about that. But also the shape of these melanosomes and the way they're packed, which is what Riley was talking about in terms of the, the um, uh, this iridescent color, that really only tells us about iridescence, blacks, greys, reds and browns. So colours that are blues, yellows, oranges, purples, they're formed in a different way in, in living animals. And we don't have the cells. They don't, they don't have cells that, that have shape, you know, the codes for colour. So we, we might not ever know um, whether we would have, you know, purple dinosaurs with orange stripes, which is kind of a bit sad. And maybe for the, the dinosaurs that I work on, um, it's a little bit more difficult to determine what colours they were. Mm -hmm. Although Ellen, I think, got, sorry, yeah, Warren, right? yeah, there was uh, Borealis pelta. So that was one where just the, the preservation was so exceptional, where this was a an ankylosaur that floated out to sea, basically got washed down a river, bloated, got buried in this marine environment to the point where the keratin that covers the scutes, the armor was still preserved. And I think in that, again, like as, as Susie was saying, that this is not the complete coloration, but some of those scales on top would have been sort of a rosy red and beneath it was lighter. So this is counter shading, so darker above and lighter below. So again, this might not be the entire picture of what this animal looked like, but I kind of love this image of this, you know, 20 foot long, heavily armored dinosaur wandering through this ancient forest. And it's just this blushing red color. <laughs> it's just wonderful to imagine. Helen, have you got a favorite one? Yeah, well, there is there is there is a really interesting distinction here that, that Riley mentioned, but I think it's worth digging into, which is this difference between pigment based color and structural color and pigment based color um, is because light falls on a molecule which absorbs some wavelengths and the others and you get the others back. And that's um, the, you know, the anthocyanins and the carotenoids that we see today. Structural color um, is because of a shape. So little scales, for example. Um, or it's a very specific structure that could be preserved. And think the reason this is interesting is that in the modern world, in the living world today, there's a very clear distinction. Pigmented colors are the reds and the yellows. There is no pigment in the natural world, which is blue, which is the reason no one can ble breed blue roses. Um, so even greens, for example, blues and greens in nature today are all um, structural color. So they're all caused by a structure. And the reason, but this week in nature, there is actually, and the reason for that is the way the mole, the anthocyanin molecules work, it's very hard to stretch them enough to generate a blue. But in nature this week, actually, there was a paper saying the first, I've got it up here, the first um, artificial blue anthocyanin has just been discovered. So it may be that the pigment might be possible because up till, up till now, I think everyone would have said, if we stand a chance of finding the color, it's more likely to be the blues and greens. Um, and we won't know about the reds and yellows, although I'm sure I've seen a dinosaur fossil which had feathers and someone told me it's got red stripes on its tail. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So, but yeah, so, so maybe, so, so it's, even, it's even less clear because it turns out that this chemical structure might actually be possible even though it's not present in any natural living thing today. It might be possible to have a blue pigment, but structural colors are really common, they're everywhere. There's, there's all kinds of blue things. So there's no, there's no problem with having blue. And if it is structural color, it, it might be preserved. It's hard, but it's possible, but it's possible. Brilliant. Right now we've got 21 minutes. We've got 25 questions. Let's see how many we can get through. Uh, this is from uh, Lisa would like to know, uh, is it likely that we will discover any new uh, very large dinosaurs? I suppose the kind of Giganotosaurus or uh, um, T-Rex, or is it considered that probably we've discovered all of the largest species now? Uh, Susie. 
Mm. We haven't discovered all of the species of dinosaur that ever lived. And, and there are almost certainly dinosaurs as large or maybe even larger than the largest dinosaurs that, that we know. Um, the dinosaurs dominated ecosystems on Earth for... 160 million years um, and as Helen said right at the beginning actually the, the the last dinosaurs to live are closer to us in time than they were to the first dinosaurs to live so they were around for a really 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 long time um, and obviously you know every time that, that, that means there's loads of generations of dinosaurs loads and loads of different dinosaurs and an almost unimaginable number um, of dinosaur species must must have lived and we are nowhere near close to finding all of them and in fact a new dinosaur is named I think on average about once a week um, so some of those dinosaurs are are new because they've been found um, because somebody's been out in the field and dug a new one up but sometimes they're just found by people um, going through museum collections and realizing that specimens that were thought to be one thing are actually something else in the light of new data and new discoveries and new understanding. Um, I think in, in the Natural History Museum's dinosaur collection which I'm a curator of, um, right now I can think off the top of my head of about three or four undescribed dinosaur species that we have right there um, just off the top of my head, so there's probably loads more. And in terms of big dinosaurs, I mean, it's really interesting because the biggest dinosaur that we have is probably Patagotitan, which is this huge uh, titanosaur from um, Argentina. And um, they, that, you know, we, we might be thinking that that is kind of approaching what it is, what what is physically possible to be, you know, it, to, to walk on Earth, you know, how, how how could anything be much bigger than that and, and literally and walk around without you know its limbs literally physically collapsing? Um, but every time we think that, somebody finds something bigger. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we find a bigger dinosaur. Brilliant, thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Riley, this is from Crystal, who'd like to know, is it widely accepted that stegosauruses and similar plates, uh, the plates they have, were used for defence, or is it possible that they might have been decorative or used for mating rituals? Well, why would I answer this one when we've got Susie right here, and this is her group of dinosaurs. <laughs> Susie, Go you want to take then. this one? <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so, uh, yes, we don't know, um, but... Um, People have suggested that, that stegosaur plates were for um, active defence. I think that's probably unlikely in the case of something like stegosaurus because they were really, really thin. Um, and they also didn't cover all their body. They only were on the back of their bodies. Um, but they might have been used to, to deter predators. So um, they could have made the animal just kind of look, look bigger than it actually is. So I was in a museum collection in China one time when they were taking down um, a mounted stegosaur. And actually, when they took the plates off, I was like, wow, that looks like a really small dinosaur. And then, you know, but when the plates were on it, it just looked much bigger. So it could be like a display structure to try and put predators off. I mean, they, maybe they could have uh, flushed blood into their plates. Maybe their plates were red, like we were talking about earlier with ankylosaurs. Um, could they, uh, what was the other one, uh, display? Display, so they could have been for mating. They could have been for to making sure they were mating with the right people. If they were, if there were lots of different species living in the same environments, they would have wanted to make sure that they were, they were mating with the right people. The problem is all of these ideas are really, really hard to test. Um, and that's kind of, kind of fundamentally the issue. So we can kind of speculate that maybe maybe all of those things, but really hard to test. Mm -hmm. Right now, the next question, yeah. Ari, who's seven years old. Hello, Ari. Uh, would like to know is there, uh, would like to know is there a dinosaur for every letter of the alphabet? And did all dinosaurs mate for life? Which seems reasonably disconnected, but I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take a crack at that one. I, I think, from what I recall, we do have a dinosaur for every letter of the alphabet. You can do a whole dinosaur alphabet with plenty of choices between them it gets a little bit harder around the, the the q's and the z's and the x's and things like that but they are there but in terms of dinosaurs mating for life um you know there are so many hundreds and hundreds of species of dinosaurs maybe some of them did um that's something that it's just incredibly hard to test that's one of the things where like we wish we had a time machine and can go back to the jurassic and, and observe this and just spend years looking at these animals but unfortunately it's something we just don't know but also you've read ray bradbury you know how dangerous it'll be if we ever get that time machine just <laughs> <laughs> just walking off the path for a moment everything changes this is from jess who's age 11 hello jess uh and uh, we kind of to some extent you've mentioned this or, or, or already susie but uh jess is interested do you think we'll ever run out of fossils could we find all of them um no and no 
So, as I explained earlier, you know, dinosaurs are just around for such a long time. Um, and we've been looking, we've only been looking for them for like, I don't know, 150 years or something. So we will never run out of dinosaur fossils, let alone fossils of all the other life that lived in the 541 million years of uh, since, you know, multicellular and hard, harder bodied animals evolved. So I don't think we're ever going to run out of fossils. Um, they're everywhere, everywhere you look. Every, even if you go into the shopping centre and you're, you know, you're having a wander around mm. in the shopping centre and you look down at the ground, um, at the stones that, you know, make up the walls or, or the paving and you'll see fossils in those. So we're never going to find them all. We'll never stop looking and we'll never, we'll, ne we'll never uh, have all the answers, I think. That's yeah, just because we're talking about, about time as well, just real quick, that the first dinosaurs evolved about 235 million years ago. By 200 million years ago, by the time dinosaurs are really taking off and becoming really important in global ecosystems, there are already dinosaur fossils. Like if you think about a million years in the past from now or even 10 million years in the past from now, we have petrifactions. We have fossils that have been mineralized from those times. So by the time of T-Rex, there was an entire dinosaur fossil record. And that just blows my mind that there were dinosaur fossils while they were still dominant on this planet. Yeah, it, 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 that timeline is, timeline is so remarkable. And the, uh, Patrice has got to, again, this is a, a, one of those very interesting things, just how difficult it is to know these things. Patrice wants to know, is there any evidence of what sort of diseases dinosaurs dealt with? For instance, did they get cancer, right? Yeah, uh, just last year, we had our first report of a malignant bone cancer in a dinosaur. as a centrosaurus found in uh, Alberta, in about the 75 million year old rock. And We've found dinosaur bone cancers uh, earlier than that. I just saw a cast of Sue. In fact, a Sue the T-Rex that was on a traveling exhibit in Denver and Colorado. And even that one skeleton, there were several breaks that were healing on one side of the skeleton. There was arthritis in her vertebrae that they couldn't move very well. Her lower jaw has these large holes in it that were created by a parasitic infection that still infects our raptors today. When raptors eat pigeons, they get the small microorganism that eats away at the bone in their jaw and their throat. And many of the things that just come from having a skeleton, the various breaks, bone infections, bone cancers, things like that, we find the same things in non-avian dinosaurs. So many of the things that we deal with, just personally, when we go to the doctor, dinosaurs also had to deal with in their own way. You know what's amazing about that, though, is it highlights. So um, the place I saw this most is, I think it's the La Brea Tar Pit, right? And their, their museum in Los Angeles is just all the skeletons, all of them, <laughs> and because that's what's in the tar pits. But so what, what's astonishing about them is that after, they all look the same. I mean, you're looking at horses and early horses and, you know, dogs, dog-like things and just every type of animal. But they're all basically, they've got a rib cage, which looks a bit like this. They've got hips that look a bit like that. They've got legs. And actually, when you think about it, the idea that you can look at a fossil that is 200 million years old and there are diseases in it that are like diseases we recognise, given all the variety of life, actually, it's kind of all the same. I mean, the similarities are far bigger than the differences which is really interesting all by itself. It's, it's astonishing that the same type of disease could occur 200 million years ago in an animal that we will never see. But actually it's because we're kind of the same on all the big, you know, four limbs, got a rib cage, got hips, got vertebrae. It, it's basically the same. I find that incredible. Now, uh, you mentioned earlier about Jurassic Park being in the news and uh, DBX98 uh, has a question, said uh, with uh, Max Hodak and uh, Elon Musk reckoning they have the technology to recreate Jurassic Park and they said that, uh, that they wouldn't be genetically authentic dinosaurs but maybe 15 years of breeding and engineering to get super exotic novel species uh, and DBX98 wants to know, does this mean making a new species of dinosaurs, wouldn't that make them not dinosaurs? And I won't ask the third part of the question because we're going out too early for that particular language. But I know exactly what you mean, DBX98. Well, yeah, we have any, for starters, we don't have any DNA from non-avian dinosaurs. DNA has a half-life. It decays at a steady rate under most conditions. It takes really exceptional conditions for it to, preserved, to be preserved. I think we just pushed the envelope on the oldest DNA, uh, genomic DNA, found, found this year from a mammoth that was a million years old. So we'd have to get to 66 to get to a, anything like T-Rex. That's even the last of the non-avian dinosaurs. And it just doesn't preserve that long. So, I mean, this is just, it's blowing smoke. Like the, there's no way that they have the technology or the know-how to do this in any sense whatsoever. If you want to see a dinosaur, look out the window and hope you see a bird and you can enjoy your own little Jurassic Park. That would be my recommendation if you want to see this become real. <laughs> so I think, DBX, <laughs> your, your third question, the answer is yes. 
There's a much bigger thing here, though, which is that so I have seen um, been in science labs where they are dealing with uh, interspecies IVF. Uh, and sometimes it's to bring back endangered species, which you can justify. Um, but sometimes and they're often using the DNA of dead animals to bring back these. Species. And here's the thing about every animal I saw that had been they were miserable. Right. They had been born to an animal that was a different species that hated them. They didn't have any of the normal bacteria that their own species would have had. They didn't have any of the same social cues their species had had. And the problem is you can totally see this being a rich person's toy. And mm. it involves immense cruelty. And I think that that's what I hear in my head every time something like this comes up, is that these animals, any of this playing like this, it is playing. And it is playing for the benefit of a rich person, not for anybody else's benefit, including the animal which is created. So I think it's really ethically horrible, basically, yeah. however much I would like to see a T-Rex. Yeah, and that goes for mammoths as well, where it's like an animal's not just its genes, right? It's not just its genome, it's behavior, it's things that are passed down. So if you just create something, even if you could, you're creating it entirely out of context. There's no idea what it is, how to behave, any of those things. So I, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Is it, I mean, is that, would you say, I, I know there's always a danger in saying that, you know, play, playing God idea, but it, when we do see things like this, and you say, it, is that just bravado and I can do this? And I know that, you know, because it's always a question, we have a lot of different scientists' ideas, what is the point? And normally there is a point, but it, oh, I, what would the point be? I, I think it's showing off. I think it's like we, we think that we can, and it's not listening to ethics. It's not listening to what we need. We see this in the de-extinction debate when people, when George Church talks about like bring back a mammoth or something like that. Nobody's asking for this. He's just saying, I'm going to do it because I can. There's no place for this animal to go. It wouldn't even be a, a mammoth because there's nothing to teach a mammoth how to be a mammoth. It would just be our idea of what a mammoth is. So I think it's just try this idea of like the power of science, like look what I can do. And it's really ethically suspect for that reason. Like nobody really wants this. As exciting as the idea could be, it grabs headlines, but that's really all it does. Yeah, absolutely. And you you know, in a, if you worked in a university or for a research institute, you would never get this sort of thing, like never. And, and the reason that, that somebody like Elon Musk or you know just super rich people can just come along and just do a thing because they want to do a thing like that's why we have these ethics approvals at university because this is totally totally unethical so just and it, you know there, there is that that line in Jurassic Park right where you know they, they were so busy worry, worrying about whether they could that they didn't think whether they should and that's absolutely right you know it's, it's, it's it was spot on then and it still is now is now it always, I know, it's, I know it's a very simplistic thing to say, but it always smacks to me that, you know, a bit like when we talk about terraforming Mars and you go, well, well let's just keep working on Terra, first of all, which is, you know, where, where we actually have some of it. And in the same way, there's so many species that are going instinct. Let's really work hard on that. But I, uh, um, now this is definitely for you, Riley, because this is a yeah. Brontosaurus situation question. Okay, uh, and this is from Jonathan. Where are we at with the Brontosaurus situation? Are they back as a proper species now? I'll say you can if you want. Um, so really, what, there, there, there's one paper, but as we know, like science is a process, right? And like, if you get a result, somebody else has to come along and test it. See, do I get the same thing? Am I seeing the same thing? Is this repeatable or not? So we have three, or we, we had three Apatosaurus species that are all distinguished by subtle, subtle traits between each other. Brontosaurus would be Brontosaurus excelsus. So basically, if you had a little evolutionary tree, you'd have Brontosaurus over here and the two Apatosaurus species over here. But they still share a closer common ancestor with each other than other sauropod dinosaurs. So if this were a modern species, we'd probably say, okay, that's all the same genus. It should just all be Apatosaurus because they're closest to each other to the exclusion of everything else. We can make the philosophical case that, okay, every dinosaur species should have its own genus as well. But that really gets down to taxonomy and systematics, like how we figure out the logic of how we name things and organize them. So to me, it makes sense to still call it a patasaurus. But if people keep, if we find another dinosaur, for example, for example, and we get two brontosaurus species that have things in common that the apatosaurus species don't share, that would be a really convincing argument that it should be its own genus. So it's one of those things where like we can use the name. It's kind of back. Paleontologists will know what species you're talking about when you say Brontosaurus, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's confirmed yet. It's we, we need more research. Uh, uh, Riverdale has a question, which is very much a what if question, but uh, it is, if dinosaurs had survived, do you think humans would have still eventually evolved 
and then managed to kill off all the dinosaurs. But it's mainly the first part. I mean, because that's such an interesting bit about these small mammals that then end up taking over. So uh, starting with you. Yeah, I mean, I think like fundamentally, we'll never know the answer to that question. But I think that what we do at least think about after the end Cretaceous extinction, when the dinosaurs went extinct, there was probably a whole kind of space, vacant ecological space, where the dinosaurs had basically occupied all of these niches that mammals do today, or almost all of them. So there were dinosaurs that lived up trees, there were dinosaurs that burrowed, there were big dinosaurs, there were small dinosaurs, there were all different sorts of dinosaurs living everywhere. And like, they all go extinct in a really, really, really short period of time. So all of those kind of spaces were available for other animals to evolve into, if you like. And the mammals appear to have really kind of grasped that opportunity and gone crazy and taken over. And of course, we are mammals, so we've evolved from that. So the radiation of the mammals and the evolutionary success of the mammals may well have been because the dinosaurs went extinct and basically vacated this space. Um, we don't know that for sure. We don't know that the dinosaurs wouldn't have got, that the mammals wouldn't have outcompeted the dinosaurs at some point in the future. They hadn't throughout the whole of the Mesozoic, but it's possible that they might have done. Um, but I suspect that the evolution of the mammals was at least partially, um, you know, that their success was at least partially due to the, the extinction, yeah. Right. Absolutely, yeah. Mammals started started to radiate during the Mesozoic. Like the oldest mammals that we know of are about as old as the oldest dinosaurs. And that's one of the really wonderful things that like I've loved seeing in recent years as more of these discoveries come out is that it's not just these small little insectivore shrew-like things. There were equivalents of beavers and raccoons and opossums and flying squirrels and things like that that lived alongside dinosaurs. In fact, the oldest primate that we know of, a little animal called Purgatorius, was present at the same time in the same ecosystem as T. rex and Triceratops survived the mass extinction, and then set off this primate radiation that happened the next you know, million years or so and, and following. But if the non-avian dinosaurs had survived, if that asteroid impact had been canceled, and that's in, I'm very much in this because that's the book I'm writing now about what happened in the second, the hour, the you know everything following. Yeah, there probably wouldn't have been humans at all. If you look at our own history in the past, you know, several million years ago, there are multiple human species around the planet at the same time. Now there's just the one. We have a much more tenuous hold on existence that relies on all these preconditions to happen. And that mass extinction, I think, was one of them. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, to one final question to you, Helen, just to remind you again, we're not here uh, next week, but Helen will be here with Ginny Smith talking about uh, the nature of time and our understanding of it. Uh, and uh, also the latest uh, Tips for Existence is going to be out on Wednesday, I think. That's with Neil Gaiman and uh, the current uh, Uncanny Hour about Exorcist 3 with Mark Gatiss and Mark Kermode. And uh, they're all the marks in that episode. There's other, other non-marks in the episode as well, including Reese Shearsmith and Sam Deegan. Uh, that's up and out now. Now, uh, now, this is about a blog that I've not read your blog post yet that went up on Cosmic Shambles, Helen. Uh, this is from John, says, in reference to Helen's blog, uh, um, wants to know about that documentary immediately springs to mind. That in caps lock. Now, I don't know what that uh, documentary is. And uh, the question is whether you think that uh, ultimately, uh, with fact checking, etc., these kind of documentaries will lead to people not asking questions and will lead to closing down some kind of subjects. Can you give us a little bit of background of what your uh, blog was about? Blog it's not anything terribly profound i was just worried about something on saturday nights and so i started writing and it turned into a blog it's one of those and um what, what i was talking about is the difference between what i was calling experts and messiahs and the difference between someone with a loud voice in public or someone with a voice in public who's saying well here's a situation there are nuances but here's some knowledge here's the evidence for it oh you know let's do something with this and the difference between the voice that comes in and says i've discovered something it's usually a conspiracy this is the simple thing you're evil if you don't agree with me. And I was, and what we're seeing more and more is that the world's a really complicated place and people just want a simple, just tell me what's happening. And actually, if someone comes along and says, I've got the answer, they're the villain, they're the hero, believe me or don't, you're evil if you disagree with me and shuts down all debate. That is, you know, there's more and more of that. And so, and I was talking about the solution to this being principles. What It might be hard to know um, how to do things, but you do know what to do. Be nice, be kind, be respectful, that's the basis. That those are the things that matter. The how you do it just kind of follows on from that. So I was talking about that. And that documentary, which and the questioner is right, this is what set this off, is Seaspiracy on Netflix. Um, it's a very 
I would say controversial, but it isn't actually controversial in the sense that people either completely buy it or they completely don't. And the problem with it is it highlights very real problems in the oceans, but it says the solution is simple. It lumps all the fishing in as big industrial fishing. It ignores the livelihoods that people make from fishing. It ignores that those aren't the only problems that, you know, it, it sort of, it claims there's been a conspiracy to, to hide all of this. And even more importantly, if you question the filmmakers on any of this, they just say, you're the enemy, that you're nonsense. I'm not listening to your evidence. I have discovered the truth. This is the end of the story. And the problem is it's very compelling. And everybody agrees the film, which I, and I have to say, the reason I have not seen it, and I thought a lot about this, is that... Um, I don't want to encourage Netflix to make these films. All Netflix wants is for people to watch their films. And that's the reason these things exist, because people watch them on one side of the debate or the other. And I kind of don't want to give them that oxygen. So I recognise there's a hypocrisy in commenting on something I haven't seen, but I have heard a lot of experts who I trust talking about the various sides of it. And um, so that's the context, is that the blog was about we need principles that involve nuance. And whenever some com someone comes and says, I have got the magic solution, those people are evil, I'm not listening to any evidence that says there's any subtlety. That is the most dangerous thing facing us. And so um, I can't actually remember, ask, remember what the question was now. <laughs> That's fine. You covered a lot of their ground there and of their ground there, and I'm yeah. sure somewhere <laughs> along there was the answer. I'm certain somewhere in there but was. But hooray for nuance. Uh, so that my point, the, the, the thing that we, apps, the most powerful thing we have is questioning and listening and looking at the evidence. And nobody is 100% perfect and nobody is 100% villainous. And if you just steamroller in, and say you are all evil, you are part of the problem in a sense because you're no, you're just going to create an enemy, and that's not the way to solve problems. You need to bring people with you, and you do that by discussion of nuance. And so, please don't listen when if people say I have discovered a thing, that's okay. But then look to see who's disagreeing with them and what evidence they bring to it and what they know, and make up your own mind. Don't be sucked into the easy narrative because that's really dangerous. That was my, I, I that, would that, do that, that test when I test when i when I, I think well i might watch that documentary and i go people who watch this also watch that and i go oh oh no 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 and uh, so i'm gonna be watching series two of call my agent i know i'm very behind on that one but uh, i can highly recommend that there's no easy answers in call my agent uh thank you so much uh to riley uh, skeleton keys is out now there's a new book obviously on the way and other books as well so go and uh, look up that work thank you so much susie i look forward to when we can all start going around the natural history museum again as well and exploring hopefully those days aren't too far off helen uh i won't see you next week but you will see people uh next week thank you very much to our producer trent burton as i said before if you can support us via patreon patreon.com slash cosmic shambles that is how we're able to make uh quite often five different things a week about lots of different subjects not just science about the arts about culture uh about philosophy and uh, also new book shambles coming up and uh, the current book shambles that's just out now which is free to everyone is with uh, katie wicks Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Enjoy the snow and the sun. And I hope they come together and I hope we can continue to do our snowbow based experiments. Bye bye. <laughs>